We welcome online people who are just arriving. And good evening to all of you who are with us in person here. <clears throat> I'm so glad all of you here and online are joining us for African Inspirations, Conservation Successes in the Huangue National Park. So um, this is the fifth in a series of talks that we're doing for Gallatin Valley Earth Day, um, which will culminate in our Earth Day, annual Earth Day Festival on Saturday, April 22nd at the Emerson Center um, for the Arts. And uh, also, we that same day will be holding a um, 5K fun run. And that fun run this year will be benefiting um, a very <clears throat> noble cause. It's the Indralin um, Audubon Wetland Preserve that's just off of downtown Bozeman here, and uh, the money will go towards that. <clears throat> so as I said, I'm thrilled to see all of you here tonight, and I'm sending a special shout out to all of you who are joining us online. My name is Ann Reddy, and I am the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee, and we are so lucky to have Zim Bob and Pro Guide Mark Butcher with us tonight. We're just thrilled about this program and I'm gonna introduce you in a second, Mark. But um, before I do that, I just wanted to give a shout out to the major underwriter of our, of our event tonight. And that is Moraway Adventures. <clears throat> and I encourage you to check out more about them on their website at morawayadventures.com and see what great adventures that you can go on with them. And then um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, <clears throat> give a big shout out and thank you. Um, tonight's event is free only because of the generous support from lots of organizations in our community, nonprofits and businesses and government agencies. <clears throat> and I wanted to give a special thanks to our fiscal sponsor, which is Greater, United, Greater Gallatin United Way and our premier sponsors, which are the City of Bozeman, Gallatin Subaru, and Audi Bozeman. And then also um, we have our benefactor sponsor, which is Sacagawea Audubon Society, and our stewards, uh, Happy Trash Can, Valley of the Flowers Landscaping, Bozeman Green Build, and last but not least, the Gallatin Wildlife Association. And of course, all the community volunteers who help all these events happen. <clears throat> and then I'd also like to give a big shout out to the Hope Lutheran Church for providing us with this lovely venue. And of course, our superb technical support from Lorreen Reed from the Sacagawea Audubon Society and Taylor Burlage. And now on to our program. Butcher. As I said, we are just so thrilled to have him here with us. Um, Mark is visiting Bozeman just for a few days from his home in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, um, where he works as the managing director of the Envelo Safari Lodges in Huango, Zimbabwe. Um, and let's see, over his 40 year conservation career, Mark has worn many hats. Uh, he was a game ranger. He was also a provincial wildlife official officer. Uh, he was a certified guide. Good evening. Uh, thanks very much for the invite to come and uh, talk to you here. Thanks very much for arranging this wonderful facility here. And um, welcome to all of you. Welcome to all you people online. Um, um, my name is Mark Butcher. I'm a Zimbabwean. I'm a long way from home, but I've yet to yet today to talk to you about some exciting stuff, you know. Um, I've been in the wildlife uh, conservation uh, world in Zimbabwe for 42, 43 years now. I started work as a young cadet ranger in 1980, uh, working for the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Management. Um, and this story kind of goes back to that time and brings you up to one of the most exciting projects I have worked on in my whole career. I'm really excited about it and I'm excited for the opportunity to talk to you about it. Okay, it's the Community Rhino Conservation Initiative, Cricky. Um, before we get into that, I'm going to talk you through how we arrived with Cricky. Okay, first off, for those of you who need a geography lesson, you all know about Africa. Uh, that green patch in the middle on the left-hand map is Zimbabwe. Uh, and I will attest to the fact that it is the jewel of Africa. 
Some people say it's only the jewel of Southern Africa, but we're definitely the jewel of Africa. It's a wonderful country, landlocked, but it's uh, full of all kinds of interesting things. But one of the best things about Zimbabwe is Zimbabweans. Um, we're very, very proud of, a, of our nation. Um, Right-hand map there is a map of our country. And I'm specifically going to be talking to you about the northwestern part. Victoria Falls is our next door neighbor. That's the uh, uh, world. Um, it, it's on everybody's bucket list. It's one of the great natural wonders of the world. And uh, next to it, you can see Wange. And that green patch over there is Wange National Park. Wange National Park um, is on what I'm going to be talking about more here this, afternoon, uh, this evening. Uh, it's Africa's third biggest national park. 5,000 square miles, 50,000 elephant, more mammal species and bird species than any other national park in uh, Zimbabwe. Um, and it's uh, one of the oldest parks in the whole of the subcontinent. Um, it was declared in 1924. And they're one of the first places where the old ivory hunting in the old days that used to happen, um, providing ivory mostly for Americans, eh, for uh, piano keys and billiard balls back in the 1900s was in 1914 when the hunting stopped up in uh, the Robbins Sanctuary, what became later incorporated into the park. Um, it's a sleeping, it's a, a, in terms of national parks, we are similar in size to Kruger National Park, which we heard of in South Africa, about 6,000 square miles. But uh, Kruger has about 1.4 million visitors a year. Wangi has about 40,000. Okay, so very, very different, um, but very, very interesting park. Okay. Up in uh, Victoria Falls, I spoke about up in the northwest, it's this wonderful, wonderful natural wonder of the world. We get people from all over the world coming to see it. Visitors, um, thousands and thousands of visitors come through the gates there every year to see this wonderful, beautiful uh, natural site. And of course, we get people coming to the park and they see all kinds of very cool things that you can see in Wangi that you can't see anywhere else. And that's about the only place I know where visitors can arrive at, in the park by uh, uh, Elephant Express and they can often get caught up with, you can't go any further because the lines are in the way. Um, and look at the delight in that young man's face there. Up close with one of the most famous lions uh, in Wangi was uh, Cecil, who was killed unfortunately in 2015, but that's his, one of his oldest sons, a lion called Lesang. Uh, and look, think about the wonderful pictures people like that can get. So we have people coming from all over the world to come and see our wildlife. And there's our friend Chris a couple of years back. Uh, enjoying Wangi's elephant. And that's what Wangi is really most famous for. 50,000 elephant. Highest elephant density on the planet in, in our dry season. And Chris was helping there that year with water. We were helping uh, provide more water for our elephant and for people, which is very, very important and part of what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, tourism facilities in the park. Uh, wonderful, uh, comfortable places for visitors and tourists to stay. Four-star, five-star accommodation and you have a wonderful time visiting paradise and staying in these fantastic facilities. But that's not the story of Wangi National Park, okay? This um, is a Google Earth map, and on this left-hand side of the screen is Wangi National Park. You can see in the center there, that line going north-south is the boundary of the park, and to the right-hand side, to the east, each one of those squares um, is a, a field, a cultivated field for a family. So every single one of those squares is a family of Zimbabweans that lives next door to paradise, okay? Sadly, they have all kinds of problems when you live next door to paradise, okay? Those people are subsistence farmers. They grow maize, they grow corn, and they grow watermelons, um, and that's all they have to eat. What you grow is what you eat. That makes you a subsistence farmer. And if you're growing um, things like corn and watermelons next to the biggest population elephant on the planet, you run into all kinds of problems. Okay, and you can imagine what five, six ton bull elephants, the biggest herbivore, land herbivore on the planet will do to a field of corn. Very quickly, they eat all the food. Now, if you have your field raided by a five, six ton bull elephant, that's all your food gone. Okay, that means kids go hungry. That means, guys, this year we're down to one meal a day. In bad years means we're down to one meal every second day. Okay, people starve because of when they live next door to paradise. And it's a thing that's not told very often. Wonderful lions, look at that. Come to Wangi National Park, see our wonderful lions, take pictures. Uh, what a glorious experience with the smiles on those visitors' faces. But uh, Zimbabweans who live around next door to paradise raise cattle, okay? And most families will have half a dozen head. And uh, what happens is uh, our banks are unreliable, so people keep their wealth in cattle, okay? Whether that's right or wrong, culturally that's what our heritage is. And when grandma gets sick, you sell a cow, and that raises the cash 
so that you can take grandma to hospital and you can have her being looked after. But if you're raising cattle next door to the biggest population of lions in, in uh, Zimbabwe, you can imagine what happens. It often ends in tears. So we get what, you know, lots of livestock being killed by lions, human wildlife conflict. Okay, HWC, it's a big catchword in conservation, but this kind of thing is, uh, uh, happens. You can imagine being a very, very poor uh, family. Average income might be in the order of $100 a year. Your life savings are tied up in five or six head of cattle. The lions come one night and kill two of, your, two of your head of cattle. So because you live next door to paradise, you lose one third of your wealth in one night. Okay, it's, this is a problem. Okay, so what, one of the biggest things, one of the things that happens from that is what, is what we call poaching. Okay, illegal hunting. And you hear here on this side of the Atlantic Ocean a lot of talk about poaching. Most of the talk is about elephant poaching and rhino poaching. But the reality is that in Africa, and particularly in our part of Africa, 95% or 96% of poaching is people hunting for meat. Okay, and hunting subsistence. They want to feed their families. Okay, and if my kids were crying at night because they were so hungry they couldn't sleep, I would do the same thing. And that's some dried meat inside the park from a poached animal. Okay, and that's one of the pictures from the bad old days. That's a buffalo. And he's been killed by some by a wire snare. Okay, that's a noose of wire um, tied to a tree on a game trail. And that buffalo's walked in there, caught himself, and strangled himself to death. Uh, but it's poaching; it's illegal inside the park. And those are some of the rangers back in the day who caught some guys. Unfortunately, wire snares are not uh, very, very target specific. Okay, elephants' trunks, okay, inadvertently get caught in wire snares. The elephant loses a trunk. Uh, trunks are incredibly important to an elephant. So there's all kinds of unintended consequences of these wire snares and this subsistence poaching. Okay, that picture goes back to our years back in the early days in the 80s and 90s, taken by National Geographic in about 1990. And one of the things that was our heritage of our colonial past was that we had national parks that were set aside for wildlife and people would, areas for people, communal areas were set aside for people. The people there weren't allowed to go in the park or they were poaching. Animals weren't allowed to come out because they were obviously raiding either livestock or eating people's crops. So we, were at, we had a low intensity guerrilla warfare around all of our parks uh, in our part of Africa. And it's still going on today in a, a lot of parks. Game rangers are at war with local communities. Okay. Clearly, this is not something that we believe is a sustainable long term um, strategy. So a good alternative is to try and involve local communities with some benefits from the park, okay? Instead of living next door to paradise and just being punished for it, let's try and have people living next door to paradise and being supported by it. And first thing you do when you wanna start a tourism project, you gotta find a nice shady tree. And under a shady tree, you build a camp. And that's um, one of the first days when we started building a lodge there at this particular camp that I'm illustrating here. The local chief said, okay guys, we can get into this tourism thing, but on one condition, I don't want any tents. I want you to build a lodge here that will be here for our children's children. And it resonated with us. We built a, a lodge made out of stone and thatched roof and everything like that. One of the first things that happened here is we had to employ a lot of people out of the local communities. That particular day, I took this photo. I'll never forget, we had 83 people working on site. 63 of them were working for the first time in their lives. So think about a young father, maybe 30 years old, 35 years old, he's got three or four kids at home. And for the first time in his life, he takes money home to his families. Think about how that changes his life. And that's just because we decided to take tourism out of the park and put it onto communal land. Okay, we build a lodge, easy enough, lots of guys working, they got jobs, they got money, they're feeding their families, they've stopped poaching. And uh, that's what you end up at the end, okay? But now this is different because this is a lodge on community land. This is a paradigm shift. We're taking lodges out of the parks and putting them outside, not on private land, not on government land, but on community land. Okay, the first thing that happens now is you go game viewing, go for drives and look at animals. But the, one of the wonderful things now is you get a chance to go and visit a local community, go and meet real Zimbabweans, not just the uh, people who are in the um, lodges. And look at that lady there, big grin on her face. She's had a lovely day. And look, look what's in her hand. She's got some beautiful hand-woven baskets. Look at the lady on the right. Look what's in her left fist. She's got a fistful of dollars there. So that lady has bought three baskets, given her 30 bucks. And the kid on the right, 30 bucks is school fees for a year. Juniors going to school. All because we took a tourist to spend some money at that village instead of spending money in town or at one of the uh, multinational hotels in Victoria Falls by bringing tourism out of the park and into communities. And this is crucial to how this whole story evolves. 
we found all kinds of things going on there. Um, schools were broken down. Philanthropy from our visitors and our guests, and here I say it quite openly in this forum, American people, the generosity of American people is, is, is unbelievable to me. Okay, I see American people coming over and traveling and they spend money and help people uh, who are in need. And it's just, it's, it's wonderful. That classroom block was paid for by uh, American visitors. And look at that school that we built there today. When we started there, there were four walls on a classroom block, no roof. Kids used to start school there. I remember watching it. And when the sun comes up, there'd be a shadow. There'd be some shade under the one wall. And they'd all sit in the shade of that one wall. And as the sun shifted around, they'd all have to move to be in the shadow of the other wall. That's how those kids started there. But look what they've got today. They've got a, a school, a place they can be educated. That lady on the left, Lindsay Norman, she writes books for kids. She does curriculum school books. Um, and our organizations, we've done over 68,000 curriculum school books to some of these kids over there. On the right is one of our young guides. Okay, so not only does he take tourists to go and visit um, animals and look at lions and elephants, but he helps kids out of his community. And look at those kids there. Okay, he's handing out bird books down at a school called Mchayele. And look how that young girl is looking at that young guide. And he's a guide from the local, from our village. He's training up as a, a learner guide. And when I took that photo, today's a pro guide. But you can see what's in her eyes. She knows what she wants to be when she grows up. She doesn't want to be a poacher. She wants to be a guide. You know, you can see that. Fantastic. By bringing tourism out of the park, bringing it out of Victoria Falls, out of the hotels, and embedding it in communities. Other things going on there. Wang is a dry, dry country. There's no rivers there. Uh, it's essential for people living there. The only place you can get water is from underground. And that water is too deep to dig a well. So you've got to drill a well. And that's drilling a well at a place called Sepepa. And look what happens. We've now got clean drinking water. A key to community health. You're drinking water out of rivers and out of ponds, all kinds of diseases, parasites, all kinds of things. But clean under, under water from underground. And uh, it's providing not only for that clinic in the background, you can see the building there, but these, uh, this family and her kids and uh, look at all those high school girls. They're coming and getting clean and healthy water. Uh, so it's supporting the community. Paid for by guests who visited our lodge from America. School feeding. When there's drought, when there's bad elephants, when there's bad elephant problems, kids go hungry. Our kids walk to school. There's no yellow buses that pick them up and take them to school. Some of our kids walk five, six, seven miles a day to school and then back again. Picture a six or seven year old kid having to do that every day. It's tough. Okay. And if you're hungry, if you're only on one meal every two days because the elephants ate your food, it's even tougher. They don't go to school. They haven't got enough energy. School feeding programs. We started that picture, I think, is from 2012, from the drought of 2012. We started feeding kids at the schools. And believe me, when those kids get their plate of, we call it suds and beans. You guys would call it grits and beans. But uh, they clean the plate. Eh? And uh, keeps their energy levels high, keeps the concentration levels high at school. And it gives them the energy to walk to and from school. Education can continue. One of the other programs, one of my favorites, we do have medical outreaches. This particular one is of a, a bunch of doctors that had come from Europe, from Spain and Italy, and they're coming over to do some work in our communities. And in an area that doesn't see doctors, okay, we're very remote. We're a long way from the cities and um, clinics. You can imagine we've all had toothache. Remember when you were a kid, you had toothache. It's, 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 it's tough, you know? Imagine having three or four uh, bad teeth. So you've got continuous toothache every day of your life for years and years. Imagine what that, that kid goes to school. There's no way he's, he's, he's being educated. He's got massive tooth pain. He's got infected mouths. Alejandra comes from Spain, whip, whips out those teeth. You can see them there. And that kid's uh, life has changed. Simple medical procedure and uh, his life uh, changes. This is pictures from COVID, from, uh, 20, from the COVID years. This is 2021. 2021, yes. That's fluorinating kids' mouths. So we can get kids' mouths uh, uh, fluorinated, builds up the strength of those teeth, helps them fight infection. Okay, so that now is the southern and eastern border of Wangi National Park. Remember that big square I showed you earlier? Here's the boundary of the park running up there, going all the way up to uh, up in the north there. That was where the Google Earth picture was. I'm going to try and... There we go. That's where that Google Earth picture was taken up there. Um, now... Each one of those icons on this map represents a community project that we've done over the past 15 or 16 years. And every one of those icons is something. It's school feeding, it's a borehole, it's a well, it's solar panels pumping water for families, it's uh, book projects. And we did have done an incredible number of things. Very, very proud of what we've achieved. 
68,000 curriculum school books to nearly uh, 100 schools. Um, we went to over 60,000 patients, 65,000 patients that we've treated in last year's medical outreach. Uh, school feeding, last year we did 420,000 school meals. Okay, a huge, huge community effort to try and help these people who are living on the edges of paradise who've got problems. But frankly, it's not enough. Okay, so what do we do now to try and increase uh, the resources we have available to us to be able to support our communities? Okay, so let's try and look for alternative solutions. We bought tourists out of the park. We need, we need more. Okay, I remembered as a young ranger, Wangi National Park was full of rhino, in particular white rhino in the south of the park. We used to manage them well. The top right picture over there is a rhino got stuck in the mud. We pulled him out of the mud. There's a nice bull rhino on the top left often moving them around between different parks, managing rhino. We had a healthy rhino population. We used to see herds of white rhino. For those of you who are not familiar, there's two species in Africa, black rhino and white rhino. Black rhino are solitary and mean, and they live in the bush, in the thick bush, and they browse. White rhino live in open country, they're grazers, they're gregarious, completely different species, different genus. Um, and a lot of my talk this evening is gonna be about uh, white rhino. But then we had a poaching onslaught in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. And in your news today, you hear a lot of talk about the poaching onslaught that's going on in South Africa. Kruger Park is being devastated, the rhino population is there. There's literally a, a guerrilla war going on inside that park. Rangers are being killed, poachers are being killed on a weekly basis, rhino are being killed. It's, 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 it's terrible. Now, we had that 20, 30 years ago. That's a photo of a white rhino that had been poached by poachers. Most of them were coming from other parts of Africa, Zaire, Congo, we're talking French, people coming from Somalia, all over Africa were coming down to get our rhino. And frankly, we were overwhelmed. And uh, we lost all of our rhino. Okay, so that's one thread of the story. The other threads I'm gonna put together and eventually I'm gonna arrive at the same place. Okay, that is Kaza, okay? And Kaza is the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Era. It's a mouthful. This is the kind of vision we have for the future of Africa's conservation, okay? You already have it here, where a lot of your parks have got populations of animals and they're isolated by people. There's no corridors between Yellowstone and Yosemite, okay? Because there's too, too much in the way, so your wolves can't move, these kind of things. What we're trying to do is we're trying to keep our ecosystems more intact by uh, conserving them on a holistic basis, okay? And cars that is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge program and it may be uh, the most exciting um, uh, vision for conservation in uh, Africa and maybe the world today. Five countries, 14 national parks, 500,000 square miles, I'm a square kilometer, I'm not gonna try and convert that in square miles, but I suspect about three, I suspect it'll be about 150 or 160,000 square miles. Okay, this is a vast tract of territory. Okay, over 200,000 elephant, okay, about, uh, uh, 60 or 70 percent of the of the elephant on this planet lie within the boundaries of Kaza, but there's less than 200 rhino there within Kaza today. The scarcity of rhino is significant. Okay, we need to do something about rhino regionally. In my beloved Wangi National Park, it's Zimbabwe's flagship national park. I spoke earlier, 5,000 square miles, 40 is over 45,000 elephant, more like 50,000. We have less than 10 black rhino left and no white rhino. In the 1980s, we had many. I showed you the herds. The last one was killed in the early 2000s, okay? Previously, there's been discussions about reintroducing white rhino into Wangi, but Wangi's animal populations are um, migratory. When you start putting fences and trying to have intensive protected zones where you've got rhino fenced in, you can guard them, you'll be blocking migration routes. So that's not an option. This gives you an idea about Zimbabwe and our numbers are not dissimilar to countries like uh, um, uh, Namibia and Kenya and that kind of thing. Zimbabwe, we have about a thousand rhino, black and white, okay? About 15% are on the National Parks Estate, okay? About 100, 150 of them on the Parks Estate. However, on privately owned conservancies, and private conservancies would be private ranch land that the guys are now protecting. Instead of running cattle on them, they're running wildlife, looking after wildlife. Private conservancies got over 85% of our rhino. Okay, so what that means is very wealthy people, usually millionaires and billionaires, uh, are in charge of 85% of our rhino. Okay, and significantly, watch this name, Malalangui. 
wonderful success story. They've got over 400 rhino that's black and white. Last year, they had over 40 uh, calves, rhino calves born there. Incredible success story owned by American philanthropist, very, very wealthy gentleman from New York, uh, who's done an incredible job looking after wildlife in our part of the world. But it's on private land. Eh? Okay, so think about what the future of that might be. It costs about $5 million a year to look after those rhino. Okay, it's $100,000 a week. Okay, now maybe what will his great grandchildren, will they want to spend $10 million a year on looking after rhino? Maybe not. So what's the future of rhino conservation? We've got a good short-term plan. Private landowners are looking after them. They're spending a lot of money looking after them. But what's the long-term future? Interestingly, Zimbabwe as a nation, we have a rhino conservation vision. And our rhino conservation vision in terms of our nation is to increase the numbers of black and white rhino populations. Okay, we need to increase habitat and rhino. Simple, nothing complicated there. But specifically it states and has done for, for maybe 20 years that in Wangi National Park, we need to reestablish secure breeding populations of black and white rhino in collaboration with surrounding rural communities. Okay, so we've known for a long time we needed to engage our surrounding communities in rhino conservation. Okay, back in 2017, uh, we decided that we wanted to try and start something. We wanted to bring rhino back to Wangi, but we wanted to do it differently. So we went down to go and see the guys at Malalangui and we said, guys, we want to bring rhino back to Wangi, but we don't want to put them in the park. We want to put them on community land. We want to change the paradigm. What we found when we got down there was how difficult it is to protect rhino in this day and age. Okay, they've got a lot of rhino, but they've got over a hundred rangers there. And those rangers are trained up to special forces standards. They could go to Afghanistan and hold their own. These guys are hot, but they're very expensive to run. Okay, that's why. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking, but they protect rhino very, very well. In 10 years, they've lost one rhino, and they're a day's walk from the Mozambique border, which is, and that's my friend, Vusa Nubi, who helped me right from the beginning. You saw his picture earlier, where he was helping school kids about five or 10 years earlier, handing out books, and he's been with me all the way. We've had a wonderful time doing it. December 2017, we first put the idea together. Welcome to the Community Rhino Conservation Initiative. All these different threads all arrive at the same place. We have to put rhino with communities. We have to generate revenue for communities. We have to help communities involve communities. It's a rural community conservation and socio-economic development program based on and stimulated by the reintroduction of white rhino, and I hope one day black rhino, along the border of Wangi National Park and the Chilocho communal lands. Okay? Easy to say, but how do we make it happen? Okay, we started this journey by saying, okay, we don't, you can look after rhinos a lot of different ways. Strategically, you can put a whole lot of rhino into a big area with a small number of rangers. We know it doesn't work. Okay. So we said right from the beginning, the basic um, principle premise of how we're going to protect the rhino is small areas, small number of rhino, large number of rangers. Okay. Pretty simple. So we have a sanctuary. And up there at the top there, you can see that little red square. That's sanctuary one. I'm going to show you how we developed Sanctuary 1. It's completed. Phase 1 is complete. We're about to start on Phase 2. But a small little area with a couple of rhino isn't a long-term viable strategy for a, a free-ranging, viable, self-sustaining population. So what's Step 2? Step 2 is to engage more communities and get them interested in what the potential, what rhino can do, bring to their community, and open a second sanctuary. Okay? Step 3, we start talking to some more communities. Let's open up a third sanctuary. Four five, got four or five sanctuaries, small areas, well protected, rhino are doing okay there, and those rhino can generate revenue through tourism. I'll show you how we do that. And eventually we link it all together. Now we've got a free ranging population of self-sustaining rhino, okay, along the border of the park. Okay, between, they're, on, they're on community land, but bordering the, the park, and it acts as a buffer zone to the park. A lot of that human wildlife conflict you saw earlier, the elephants can't get through, there's electric fences now. The lions can't get through, they're kept out. Lions have to stay in the park, stay away from the people. Okay. The reason you don't have wolves roaming the streets of Bozeman is because they were shot a long time ago. Nobody wants their kids to walk to school surrounded by wolves. Okay, the reality is the reality. Wolves are wonderful up in the Rockies, but wolves and and uh, school kids walking to school doesn't work. And one day the Holy Grail, maybe we can open them up and reintroduce the rhino back into the greater park. One day when the world has woken up and people stop killing rhino for their horns. One day when uh, people value rhino like they should. Okay, so that's the dream. 
Dreams are easy, but how do you make it happen? First step is you've got to talk to people, okay? And it's critical here, you can't go to the government now, enforce things on people, otherwise it won't work. You guys all live out in uh, where you live here and you know that if you want to get a community to uh, get behind something, you've got to start at grassroots. You've got to start talking amongst your community, start talking to your community halls, start talking to your churches, and let's talk about what we are going to do to make uh, a project come, come to fruition. And that gentleman standing up there is my partner, Jabulu Zondo. He's a sociologist, okay? I'm a game ranger. But one of his great skills is he's the most patient man on the planet. He sits and he talks to community leaders and people, and he talks to them about a dream and a vision, something they haven't seen. Most of these guys haven't seen a safari camp. You've got to take them to a safari camp. Talk to them about safaris. Show them what tourists are. Tourists are not those people that fly past in airplanes or drive past in buses, throw candy out of windows. Tourists are actually real people. And tourists are often very, very nice people. At that, some of those meetings, there was finally an agreement from the community to set aside land. And they set aside 500 acres, 200 hectares, uh, where they said, okay, they're going to pull their cattle back. Let's fence it off. Uh, we're not giving the land away. It's still their land, but we're going to fence it off. And instead of running cattle, we're going to use this as a wildlife sanctuary, more specifically a rhino sanctuary. Welcome to the Mvelo and Gamo sanctuary. Okay, electrified fences. Um, that picture of that lodge I showed you earlier under the big camel thorn tree. There it is up there, camel thorn lodge. You can see it there, right in the heart of the sanctuary. Um, and this is what I'm going to be showing you pictures of right now. It's Hotel Charlie, the sanctuary HQ. We know it's perfect for rhino because I remember it from the old days. It was full of rhino. However, the scientists will tell us there's 70% grassland. White rhino are grazers. They want neat grassland. A little bit of woodland for some shade and some uh, shrubland where they can uh, um, rest in the shade in the middle of the day. Okay, so what are we going to do to be able to run a protection agency that's going to look after rhino? They need facilities, okay? They need canteens, they need storerooms, they need an armory to block up their rifles, they need uh, bathrooms, they need uh, toilets, they need barrack rooms, they need all kinds of things. So building that infrastructure took us a, a year or two, a while. But we got all that infrastructure in. And then uh, I'm going to show you what we had to do. Okay, so we pulled young people out of the communities, the youngest and brightest, and we uh, employed them and we decided we needed to train them up to British Army level so that they could learn how to be rangers. Um, just give us a second now while we put this together. What was most interesting was we decided that we weren't going to hire ex-policemen, we weren't going to hire... Basically what this video is going to show you in a few seconds is what we went through to train these guys. You guys have seen what all soldiers and um, go through when they want to become trained. They've got to go through selection courses, physical training, shooting, first aid, radio procedure. The list goes on. <laughs> What followed was that uh, we organized a team of people that could look after these rhinos. Advance it. There we go. We've got a team of badasses. Okay. They're mean, they lean, mean, um, and they can, like I say, take care of themselves. They can take care of anybody who comes and tries and steal one of their rhino. But importantly, oh, but importantly, they're not just about uh, repelling poachers who come to the area. They're also, they're a community wildlife protection unit. They take care of their communities. Um, and straight away, you can see those pictures are on the COVID years, 2020, 2021, all kinds of problems there. And there the Cobras are delivering school food at schools. Okay, mealy meal again, the beans taking it out there, make sure the Cobras were heavily involved in uh, taking care of the people that live around them. Um, that was right at the end of school year. School's about to break up. And 
kids love nothing more than a parade, wave some flags and march with their friends who are the Cobra Rangers. And suddenly all kinds of good things are happening. Christmas Day, handing out oranges, presents to all these kids. Bellini and Orange, these kids will go through. That was the first orange many of those kids had ever seen in their lives, you know. And orange is a great delight. It's like getting a, I don't know what you could compare it to over here, but it's a huge thing getting oranges and sandwiches. Suddenly what started happening, and I was gobsmacked, literally taken, I was aghast is during break time, kids were playing Cobra Rangers, okay? They weren't playing soccer. They weren't playing cops and robbers. They were playing Cobra Rangers. Everybody's marching around now. They all wanted to be Cobra Rangers. The Cobra Rangers have become the heroes of the community. This kind of thing where you've got the law enforcement in a local community becomes the heroes of the community. This is the holy grail for law enforcement. Everything reached a fever pitch by about um, March, April last year. We presented our case to the National Rhino Committee. We finally got approval after five years to go ahead with our project. The communities knew about it. We were getting rhino finally after five years of waiting, you know, and working on it. That lady there started making aprons that were um, decorated with rhino. Why? She knows when the tourists are coming, she's, what's she going to sell? She's going to make some money for her family. She's going to not sell pictures of elephants and lions, but of, her, of rhino. Our guys, by the time I left there, our guys were in a fever, fever pitch as well. They were guarding donkeys day and night. As part of their training program, when the rhinos came, they needed to know exactly what used to do, what they could do. Firing shots in there, donkeys run. What are we going to do? Get around our donkeys, protect them. Because when the rhinos come, we can't afford one mistake ever. I went back to the Malalang we trust on the uh, 5th of May, and uh, our job then was to go and get capture our first two rhino. Okay, when I went around the Malalang area there, I saw all these rhino that I'd heard about. 400 rhino, just herds of white rhino. As I remembered, we'd had them in Wangi National Park so many years ago. Just wonderful animals. Today, totally persecuted for their horn. Rhino horn, more valuable than gold or platinum. It's 100 grams an ounce. I mean, $100 a gram. Um, so these animals there are well protected and being taken care of. And they're being taken care of by this team of, co of, of their Malungwe Rangers, National Park Rangers down there that are really um, an incredible team of guys. On the morning of the um, 5th of May, the helicopter was coming at 7 o'clock. Okay, and the helicopter was going to come with a vet. We were going to go and dart our rhino. And these guys went out at six, at, right at first light, sort of 6, 6.15. And uh, helicopter arrived, uh, 5th of May, yes it was. There's my great friend, Dr. Foggin. He's one of the premier wildlife vets in, in our country. He's about 74 years old, and he's still happy to hang out at the door of a, of a chopper with a dart gun in his hand, darting rhino. Um, we darted our first rhino. Okay, and there he is, that's number 803. Um, unfortunately, he needed two darts. You can see them stuck in his bum there. But what happens now, we dart them with M99, etorphine, very, very powerful opioid, I believe, 10,000 times stronger than uh, morphine. Okay, um, that rhino now becomes groggy, blindfold him, can't see what's going on, put a rope on his legs, and uh, then we get to work with the business of translocating them. That's getting him down, making space for the uh, crate to come in. And there we are there. What's important, that lady there, Sarah, Sarah Clegg, who's another hero, is a, a brilliant biologist. She also runs the database for these rhino, okay? And when I arrived at Malalangwe two days previously, she said, okay, um, we had been given permission by national parks to have two rhino, and I'd always wanted a bull and a couple of cows, but they gave us permission for two, but they said two bulls, okay? They said our project was too high risk to risk females. Females are more important to the national herd. If we do mess up and we lose a rhino, we don't want to lose a female. They're going to give us two bulls. I was um, um, a little bit dispirited about that, but uh, we carry on. When I arrived there, Sarah said, okay, Butch, I found the two rhino that we want to uh, send to you. And we've carefully thought about which rhino we want, okay? The rhinos need to be young. Okay, they've got to be males, obviously, but they need to be young, but they need to be mature. Okay, and rhinos lived to about 40 or 50 years old. So she said, I found two bulls, 803 and 204. 803 is eight years old. 204 is seven years old. We need them to be friends because they're going to live together. So every single sighting for the past five years, 95% of sightings, those two rhino had been together. Okay, they've been best pals since they were calves. Okay, they need to be unrelated. Okay, maternally, we both know both of their mums were different mums. Okay, you don't know fathers in animals often, wildlife, uh, but we know at least they're maternally unrelated. And they came from the eastern edge of their conservancy where they might be at risk one day. And uh, that's when the rhino's down, Sarah runs up, she sees the ear tag, she knows exactly which rhino is. The rangers were quite quite correct. They called it as being a, 
in this case 204 and 204 it is so in the box you go you know and these are the rhino now what happens now is uh, dr Foggin gets to work uh, the truck comes in brings the crate close and uh, uh, we're gonna what we're gonna do next is we are going to dehorn the rhino in this case we're gonna partially dehorn them and we're gonna insert a radio transmitter in the horn okay and there's Colin Wenham he's busy measuring up the um, uh, horn for the radio transmitter that's going to be embedded in that horn so every second for the next five years it's going to be sending out a little radio signal so we can always find that rhino and there it's in and there it's uh hang on we mixed it up but anyway there that's that's radio transmitter in now it gets filled with gel and covered over and uh those those uh, transmitters in there and i'll show you pictures later what it looks like with finished this picture here is now when you you the good thing about opioids is you can reverse them so M99, we, uh, we reverse with a thing called M5050, and that's uh, Dr. Foggin again putting in some of the reversal, because now what we have to do is we've got to wake this rhino up. But you don't want to wake him up all the way, otherwise he's going to run away and be, be crazy. You wake him up about halfway. Um, there you can see the plug has been attached. We've woken him up halfway. We've got a rope around his uh, head. A rope now is leading into a crate. And we've got a rope at the back. He's blindfolded, so he's up and he's half groggy. and we get him to stand up now the judicious use yanking on his tail and in he goes into the crate we got him in the crate we close him up behind not unlike loading cattle um, shh, and of any of your ranches but same kind of principle you just got to get them in once they're in the crate they're good to go okay we winch that crate up onto the back of the truck and remember as this was happening uh the scouts and rangers down there were radiating hey we've got the other rhino in this case Adrian three went on first two or four come and get him come and get him we said wait 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 give us but few, just keep your eyes on him we drove that rhino back, and when we arrived at the Malalangu headquarters, we have to now offload the rhino. We're going to keep it in a corral, in a we call it a boma, a small holding area like a uh, where we're going to monitor them for a couple of weeks, make sure there's no post capture issues. And there's um, the rhino. You see, he's in his crate now. We reverse them out so they don't come charging out. Uh, there's Dr. Foggin giving a little bit the rest of the um, antidote, reversing the effects of that opioid, and. Uh, there he's out, he's druggy, he's, he's still groggy, probably got a, um, and you can see where that radio transmitter has been patched up in there and we're just letting the, the gel dry. We went off and fetched his buddy, 204, and now we've got the two runners are both in, it was all done and dusted by lunchtime. Um, collected a, a bunch of data done so scientifically, there's all, all the different uh, dosages we gave them. You can see the two different ear notch pat, uh, patterns on those two rhino that identified them as 204 and 803. And, uh, both these rhino are now in a boma and we're settling them down. We're going to keep an eye on them, make sure they are uh, in good health before we put them on the long road trip up to where they're going to. That's the team that put it together. You can see everybody's grinning and smiling there. Afternoon, everybody's holding up two fingers, two rhino in the morning, pretty good work. Okay, I now spent the next two weeks fretting frantically. We went back to guarding donkeys, doing all the things to get things ready on the other side, speaking to our community members. We're going to be bringing the rhinos in a couple of weeks time. Okay, now we've got to take them on a road trip. And this road trip is about 500 miles from Malalangwe. There you see it there. We're going to drive them across the country and we're going to drive them up to our new rhino sanctuary that's waiting for them up on the border of Wangi National Park there. 720 kilometers, about five miles. It ended up taking us 17 hours. It was a heck of a road trip. When we went down to go and load them on the evening of the 21st, we decided we we're going to, you have to drug them again. You've got to do what we did two weeks before in reverse. Drug them, put them down put them in the crate, load the crates, and then wake them halfway up and off you go as you start driving again. Um, at about 6 p.m. it started raining, so now we're working in mud and water, and goodness gracious, what else? Uh, we drove out, we had a couple of baby monitors on the uh, crates, so we can sit in the front, and uh, one of the guys was sitting in the front of the truck driving, watching on an iPad, the baby monitors, making sure the rhino are okay. We went more than 20 or 30 kilometers down the road when the mounts on the baby monitors broke, and the uh, baby monitors weren't working. I was driving in front, leading the trucks and uh, uh, Colin in the truck said hang on a minute there's a problem I can hear the rhinos crashing and bashing inside there there's something wrong he said find a place to pull over we pulled over truck pulled over we both jumped up on the side the truck was just going crazy bashing on the inside we climbed up both on the side I looked over the edge Colin and Chris were on the other side looking in and 204 was on his back with all four legs in the air I mean I nearly vomited with uh, with uh, uh, concern right at that point there i looked at the other guy and oh my gosh what do we do you know fortunately in about the next 10 seconds 204 got himself together smaller bull fortunately he rolled himself over like a tortoise or a turtle 
got back up on his feet and he sat there watching him and he seemed to be okay. Anyway, we carried on driving. Later on, it turned out he was fine. He's just for his, uh, but we were absolutely mortified about what might have happened there. Carried on driving through the night. And eventually, when we turned off the tar road and we drove into Chilocho district, it was the most incredible thing that happened there because all the Cobra Rangers were now up waiting for us. Okay. The trucks came up. Uh, they all ran out, put perimeter security around the trucks, jumped on the back of the truck, and they were all safe. I started crying. It was just an incredible moment because all our plans were coming together, you know. And that's the route we drove across the community land, past all the schools and stuff. And along the way, this is what happened. We've got another video here. Let's keep our fingers crossed. But what had happened, in fact, is while I was driving, I'd been told that people were coming out onto the roads because they wanted to see the rhino. They wanted to welcome the rhino to the area. And I said, Jeepers, man, you've got to be careful. These rhinos are stressed. You've got to keep everybody quiet. Just please. And I sent guides and staff down onto the roads. Tad was there uh, organizing people. And just saying, please, guys, when these trucks come past, don't scream and shout. Keep it quiet. Uh, there were uh, dignitaries that come in from everywhere, uh, several chiefs, uh, chairman of council, members of parliament, headmen, uh, school teachers, headmasters. People who are younger than me think they see rain. Some people are remembering us. I, I, I was quite happy when they talked about introducing a rhino. Uh, it's not only going to service this area of mine, but Wanke National Park in total. It was just an incredible moment. One of the other images that's important there, you saw Chief and Headman holding up a check. The very first visitors that arrived that day paid gate fees to see those rhino. The first funds started to flow into the community funds there. Okay, we over on, the, on, the, on our end now, we had to keep them in a, a boma again, a corral. Had one of about five, five acres this time, two hectares. So we can keep them in there and just monitor them, make sure again they're not injured in any way, make sure. 204 hasn't hurt himself uh, in his rolling over act in the crate. And uh, straight away, teachers, school kids, everybody wanted to come down and see their rhino. It was just absolutely incredible. These kids were just uh, agog with the excitement of seeing rhino. They'd never seen rhino, they'd heard about them, seen pictures, maybe perhaps some of them. Now they could see their own rhino. Very quickly, the rhino were given new names. Tuza, which means charge or strike, and Kusasa, which means tomorrow means the future. Kusasa, the younger one, Tuza, the bigger one. And the kids will argue today about. He's the better. But look at this now. Kids coming down, they get a chance with the Cobra Rangers, who are their local heroes. And they get a, a bottle of Mazoe, which is our, Gator, our Gatorade. But look at those kids grinning and smiling. Much more fun than mental arithmetic or trying to learn how to spell English. And they get a chance. And what's the Cobra Ranger doing? He's talking to them about conservation. He's talking about rhino. And he's talking to them about the importance of keeping your eyes open. Somebody comes into the community who's, who's a stranger, who's talking in a funny accent. Tell your mom and dad. Tell the school head. Come and talk to us. Straight away, we've got 500 pairs of eyes out there all looking and thinking. Wonderful. And look at how much fun those kids are having at Hotel Charlie headquarters with a cricket project. Proud teacher up there as well. The teachers love it as much as the kids do. By two weeks later, we um, opened up the gates of our five acre holding boma. And finally, Tuzo, who's the smart one, came out first. And there he's out. He's out through the gate. And this was them now ranging across their sanctuary for the first time. And I swear this, a rain, rainbow came out that afternoon. I couldn't believe it. 
it was a uh, it was a very special moment uh but they were walking around now exploring the new home and underneath a, a bloody rainbow it was incredible um i go back to that picture that was a picture on the first day okay uh when the first check was paid into the community trust and there's all kinds of people there's national parks officials ecologists there's uh chief uh, elected traditional leaders elected leaders uh mark saunders from the Malalangwe trust on the far side who's been an incredibly uh valuable supporter uh to this program but what's happening now is there's money going into the into the community pot okay on the other side of the fence in september we had just opened uh the, the ngamo clinic okay previously people from this community had to walk about 25 kilometers if they wanted health care you can imagine being a, a pregnant mom you want to go for uh, uh go and have your have, have your baby in a secure medical facility and go to walk 25 k's okay you can imagine a sick grandma has got to walk 25 k's to get health care so we got this new clinic but very very quickly what found out was there was problems with uh financial support to this clinic nurses weren't, weren't uh, getting paid adequately uh supplies weren't getting provided so straight away from the beginning the communities figured out very very quickly what they wanted to do with their money they want to spend the money pay their nurses with american dollars pay them well and buy medical supplies for their clinic so by about the 5th or 6th of september we're talking what's that three or four months after rhino arrived we now have free health care for all the community around the rhino sanctuary okay this lady was the first patient she'd been stung by a scorpion the night before she was in awful pain uh, a couple of our scorpions are really tough and now she's getting proper medical care taken right from the beginning think about free health care that's coming on the back of rhino think about the community's perception of those rhino one last video okay and this is one of the important parts and this is one of the things why i team up with people like chris um, and tad who gives us the help here is none of these programs work without tourism dollars okay and tourism are the most important uh are a very important cornerstone of, of, of everything we do um, when we first created the Mvelo in gamal white rhino sanctuary we always knew we would have an incredible guest activity that would interact with these rhino but what has evolved has exceeded my wildest expectations this world rhino day is a real treat for us it's about celebrating two new community rhinos to san kusefa the first back to the area in about 20 years as part of the community rhino conservation initiative one thing that's been really fantastic since they arrived here just south of wangi in may is that aside from local people and school children we've also had tourists from around the world come and meet them they visit the headquarters and there they're able to learn that there is actually a whole human dimension behind wildlife in this part of the world and that it's actually not just about rhino it's about the local people too so when tourists visit to Senkusefe, they're in fact contributing to the entire web of life in and around wangi the people and its wildlife so here's to Tusen Kusefa and all the tourists and local people who appreciate them. This is the best thing I have seen in a long time and it is for such a great project. I could never have imagined anything like that. I've got video footage of the rhinos going to sleep, eyes closing. <laughs> bringing the community together with the white rhinos that have been brought into Iwangi. They've learned how to deal with rainy days. They've learned how to do deal with uh, battery bra um, radio breakdowns. They've learned what to do when the rhinos run. They've learned what to do when an elephant breaks electric fence. All these kind of things are crucial. Phase two is underway right now. 
uh, Sanctuary 2 is under establishment. Okay, you remember the map? One, two, three, four, five, and then we link it all together. Infrastructure is under construction at Sanctuary 2. Human wildlife conflict fence, it's electric fence that's going to protect the community from uh, crop raiding elephant and livestock raiding lion is underway. And we've already got in place our uh, application for our next next rhino reintroduction. And I hope that's going to happen pretty soon in the, in the next uh, uh, latter part of this year. Okay, so that kind of brings me here to where we're at. And this is where I always end this off. Uh, very, very crucial. If you want a successful wildlife conservation program, you can involve tourists and wildlife, but if you leave out the communities, it doesn't work. Okay, if we've got communities and wildlife, and we don't have tourists, it doesn't work either. If you put all three together, now you've got a sustainable uh, ecotourism model that conserves wildlife, takes care of people, and hopefully sustains wildlife into the future. All right. They, uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Yes, it was you. truly wonderful. It was just amazing. Um, okay, so now, as I promised, um, we're going to have a question and answer um, session here. And uh, I will field a question. And uh, if you want to stay right up sure. here, we'll uh, get it to you. Um, Rich, nothing yet online. So uh, I'm going to take it to my first person here in our audience. Anticipated time frame for actually introducing females into this project. I've been asked right from the beginning, what's the timelines? Okay, we this has never been done before, so we 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 don't know what it is. We are dealing with um, thousands of household heads. Okay, they all have to agree, and you know what it is like trying to get a thousand people to agree on anything. It's very hard, so it all takes time. So interestingly, um, when I started or when we started, I thought of Sanctuary One would have perhaps one bull and two cows. Okay, that was our idea. As it worked out, we only got permission for the two bulls. And in hindsight, that was a smart decision because we didn't want to take a chance. We were really, um, we were a little bit gung-ho and perhaps it was it was smart. So what happens next now is we're going to bring more run in. So should, can we take both those bulls who are pals, move them forward and bring in a, a bull and a cow? Can we split the bulls down, bring a couple of ladies in for the one bull? What do we do here? And interestingly, uh, we put our, our, our heads together and a lot of uh, smart heads have kind of said, okay, look, if our vision is for these individual sanctuaries and then we add rhino, if we add bulls now and then later they will establish territories, they'll become territorial. If we add bulls later, these bulls will arrive into an area already occupied by territorial bulls, you're going to get mortality, they're going to fight. And probably the new bull is going to be uncertain, they're going to get killed. So the basic premise here is we want zero uh, uh, mortality of rhino. So the thinking now is actually to put bulls in each of those small sanctuaries. Okay, they can stay there, settle down, establish their territories, and then when we put it all together, then we bring the ladies. That's the idea. So, but again, that might change. Uh, is it going to take one year, two years, three years, four years, five years? When I started in 2017, I was my timeline was two years. It took five. Um, so, I would like to think Sanctu Sanctuary Tools Two has rolled out quicker than Sanctuary One. I hope three does as well, but it all depends upon people. You know, I'm dealing with all kinds of issues. A lot of the cattle owners, they've got, uh, they see this as a threat to their cattle grazing. Okay, so uh, you're dealing with all sorts of conflicting interests, and you have the same thing in this country. Uh, you have a lot of people interested who love wolves and think they're wonderful things, and a lot of people who, who don't want wolves on their land. So it's about trying to get everything together, and it takes time. So I hope it's all done and dusted in five years. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, next question. Oh, but, but for our online audience, we need it. Um, has there been any um, input from the private conservancies to maybe donate a couple of cows that the government would not otherwise let you have? Okay, so so these run have been donated by a local conservancy. So they were donated by, by Malangui. And there's a commitment to continue with that, provided we can guarantee 110% protection. So that's what our, that's what the basic premise is. We've got to prove capability. We set up Sanctuary 2, prove capability, we'll get Rhino. And uh, they love the idea too. There's a very clear uh, realization that this is perhaps a very exciting vision for what the future of Rhino conservation might be. Think about uh, hundreds of thousands of rural people in remote areas of Africa with their own Rhino and looking after them. Think about what that means for the future of Rhino conservation. It's exciting. And they recognize it. 
but we've got to do it right. We're going to do it slow and careful, not make any mistakes. We're not going to try and be too, get to um, move faster than we can protect things. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, Butch. It's just great to see that the rhinos are surviving and doing so well. My question is, <laughs> how secure is the community lands? We've seen in Zambia, for example, that there is a lot of conflict over community lands and in other countries in Africa. And so my question is, what are the risks to the community now that there are higher value assets on their lands? Okay, in my opinion, okay, I see it not as risks, but I see it as benefit. Okay, they've got free healthcare suddenly. Okay, suddenly now I think, okay, what do these communities think about when they get five rhino, when they get 10 rhino? Uh, already we've created 50 jobs, 50 new jobs. This is an area that's 95 percent unemployment. Okay, we're employing more people with the rhino project than we are with all our tourism projects. So I think there's a realization that there's large numbers of benefits. Okay, is that community land secure? It's secure so long as the community are happy with what's going on there. If we try and do something on community land that the communities are not happy with, it's not going to work. So the, it's really important to make sure that we engage with the communities and the communities are fully behind this project. And you saw it up there, so far so good. Uh, and really important that we don't force other sanctuaries down other communities' for throats against their will because then it's going to fail. But provided we get invited in to set up a sanctuary, we'll go ahead and do it. And how long will that take? One year, two years, three years, but we don't want to move this thing faster than what the communities do. And the security of it is the communities are in charge of it. They are custodians there. Um, and no politicians can take that, can can upset that because because that's the people live there, that's their place. So I think it's secure. I Thank hope it's secure. You. Thank you. Next question. In the private conservancies where they were successful at rebreeding black and white rhinos. Are they allowed to intermingle? And if they are, are they allowed to, are, do they interbreed so that we no longer have pure black and pure white rhinos? Okay, so um, there are a number of areas, both in the conservancies and in South Africa, where you have black and white rhino. In fact, in our national parks, when I was a young ranger, lots of black and white rhino. They're absolutely completely different genuses. They're not even, uh, they, they are distantly related. They don't interbreed. I've never heard of any interbreeding by them. They actually occupy different um, uh, niches within the ecosystem. So black rhino typically are browsers and they typically live in uh, 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 well-wooded, bushy, shrubbed areas where there's lots of food for them. White rhino are grazers, so they prefer open grasslands. So, so there's very little competition between them. Um, I've seen inter-specific inter conflict between them at waterholes, but usually they keep out of each other's way. Anything else, guys? Okay, thank you. We have another question right here. How do you generate your electricity? It's it's all solar. It's all solar. We've got yeah, all our fences are run with solar panels. That hotel Charlie's run. Uh, we've got solar panels and batteries that uh, run everything. All our radios are charged. It's all solar. Our lodges are all solarized too. So we've been solar for a long time. Um, yeah. We use, we've been using solar power for a long time. We've got lots of sunshine there and, and we don't have access to the main grid for, 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 for power. Back in the old days, we used to use elect, uh, diesel generators. But once solar started coming online, uh, we've been using solar technology for more than 10 years. Great, okay. Um, just checking in, are there any online questions yet? No, okay, then we'll keep on going here. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the dynamics are like between you guys who are coming in and introducing these rhinos? And if I understand correctly, it's through, I think, Crikey or the National Park Service. So what is the conversation like between the folks coming in, designing the sanctuaries, bringing the rhinos in, and the communities there? Like, what is the involvement? And you said previously that the communities are the true stewards of the area and they're the ones protecting the rhinos but to what extent are they involved with like the planning and some of the more strategic thinking around the sanctuary okay that's a, a good question okay one of the most one of the reasons that it's taken so long to put it together is because it's so complicated there are so many players there's all the individuals within a community 
national parks with the overhead um, or the or the uh, authority that um, looks out, that is in charge of all wildlife in our country is in especially legally specially protected animals like rhino uh, us as private um, uh, NGO and private tourism operator who are now providing uh, the technical support and the resources to put a project together and on top of that uh, rhino experts ecologists vets uh, people who understand how much land you need for two rhino how much land you need for three rhino can you put bulls and cows together so what it's been is it's been a very very complicated but I believe successful um, exercise in uh, involving a lot of players together and having a discussion and going forward one step at a time let's do this what about that um, and I'm very very proud that um, just recently our National Rhino Committee had a, a meeting uh, and the National Rhino Committee has maybe 100 people that uh, sit on that and that's private landowners NGOs in, uh, involved with rhino conservation national parks authorities ecologists uh, people from private enterprise all talking together all like-minded what are we going to do how are we going to look after rhino and at the most recent one there was a very strong realization of the of the in incredible potential of this project and i only i wasn't at the meeting i was over here um working as i am right now but there was only one question about that and it was a question about you know how are you financing this uh, but everybody realizes that it's working um when you go into the communities um and this is an interesting topic I was talking about the other day. Um, one of we did a baseline survey from our National University of Science and Technology, Bulawayo University, the sociology department all came up. A lot of postgrad students came up to try and set up a baseline socio-economic survey. We can decide about how much consensus is there amongst the community, how and where is the community at in terms of the socio-economic level, so we can measure how this thing goes forward. It's going to be very interesting to measure this over the next five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. And um, uh, they collected all that data. Later on, some of the parks ecologists came in and said, hey guys, part of our mandate now was check to make sure the community is behind this thing. And they went out and they were ecologists, not sociologists. One of the things they found out was there were, there were people who didn't want the project. Okay, surprise, surprise. We all live in a, a community where there's democracy. Where can you ever vote on any issue where there's 100% support for anything? Okay, but in fact, what was going on was about 90% 90, 90 support. So most people were in support of it. So the overwhelming majority were in support of it. Um, and that's often the best we can do in situations like this. Um, that answer to you. Thanks. Okay, we've got an online question from Jan that she asks, why do you cut off part of the rhino horn? Okay, so the answer to that is, and this is a very, very big uh, thing in, in, in rhino conservation. The theory is that if you dehorn rhino, they're less valuable to poachers. Okay, because now they've got it, instead of being worth Half a million bucks only worth what's worth on the uh, the nub. So we were dehorning our rhino. Okay, that's what we wanted to do to make them less valuable to poachers. However, we wanted to put a um, antenna in there so we could de so we only partially dehorn them. But it just makes them less valuable to poachers. The other reason that you dehorn them is in translocation. Okay, what you don't want is a rhino in a in a, a crate with a long horn that he's now going to dig in into a corner of that crate and maybe break his horn off. And now it causes a wound on his on his on his forehead. So we always dehorn before tr before translocation. The horn grows; it grows like hair or fingernails. A couple of years from now, that horn's growing along, and it it will be replaced. But that's the main reason why we dehorn. Okay. Next question. Hold on. I actually have a comment. I've been to Huangi. I've had the opportunity to be there and several other parks that you actually walk through. So what I wanted to say to everyone here and online, go, it's, it's indescribable how beautiful it is. It, <clears throat> the first time, I still remember the first time I saw an elephant, it was like dusk and I, I just landed in Zimbabwe and it, it's, it, it's, it's magical. So if you have the opportunity to go, definitely encourage and thank you for sharing this. It, I'm very grateful. Thanks very much, music to my ears, thank you. Yeah, do that. Speak to Chris, speak to Alexis, they're here. Um, but one of, you know, people often ask me on this side of the ocean, what can we do to help? What can we do to help? One of the best things you can do is come on safari with a reliable operator and come and spend, make sure that your money is spent wisely. And it's great fun. All right, guys, go ahead. A couple questions. Um, if you survive getting caught poaching, what's the punishment? And who's the main market for the poached rhino horns? Okay, so uh, different countries have got different rules. 
in Zimbabwe, there's a mandatory seven-year minimum for uh, rhino horn or um, uh, elephant ivory. Typically, with a good prosecution, most of our judges are, are, are delivering stronger sentences, that, often nine or ten years that you go to jail for. Um, uh, that's if you survive initially. That the, uh, that's the first step. The second step is where do the second question is where do the rhino horn go to? Okay, from what I know, and I'm not an expert in the rhino horn trade, but everything I know is that uh, it's going into Southeast Asia. Vietnam and Laos is where most of the rhino horn is going these days. Ultimately, most of it for sale in China. Um, so it's being used in the uh, Far East. Are there any more online questions? No? Okay. Um, any last call for questions? Oh, one more here. Mine is a comment as well. I had the opportunity to meet Mark, as some of us, some others of us, through a trip with uh, <clears throat> with Chris's uh, Moraway Adventures, and in 2012, I did a trip to Tanzania with a different outfitter, and I want to tell you that this is the way to experience it, to be able to understand more about the culture and the conservation, and to support uh, an operation like Imbello. It was just a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I think, uh, do we have any online, last online questions? Okay. Then thank you again so thank you much. Thank you so much. If we could have a round of applause. It really was so thank you. really, really wonderful. I can't say enough. And I don't know if we can get to the last slide, but it doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to let you know that um, this um, talk was recorded tonight. And uh, by Monday next week, we will have it up uh, available on our website at GallatinValleyEarthDay.org. We have a YouTube channel, and uh, you can. And if you have registered for this event, then we will automatically, in an email, send you the link to that talk. And feel free to share it with whoever you'd like. And I just want to give a plug for our next talk in our series. It's right back here again next Thursday. And this talk is Solutions for Montana's Trout Fisheries Facing a Changing Climate. And it's with Connor Parrish from Trout Unlimited. And that should also be a fantastic talk. So uh, thank you again. I encourage you to go out in the hallway and find out more about your next adventure with Moraway. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.